Jeff Smith. He's from EarMEP. And here's some discharge for you. We'll be right back. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. On the line is Grant F. Smith from the Institute for Research, Middle East Policy. And we're talking about the finally declassified statement on Jonathan Pollard by Casper W. Weinberger, former Secretary of Defense under Ronald Reagan. And uh, But we still don't have the military damage assessment. They're still sitting on that one. But now, so Grant, take us through this and uh, talk to us about what exactly uh, Casper Weinberger says in here. Right. Well, Casper uh, is uh, rebutting some responses by Pollard's defense team. And if anything really got Pollard a life sentence, it's the fact that after his guilty plea, in his plea agreement, he promised not to talk to the media as much because uh, the government didn't want him to relay classified information and didn't want him to you know, take his case to the, the court of public attention. So uh, basically, Weinberger's complaining in his statement the fact that Pollard uh, was comparing himself to an Israeli pilot shot down behind enemy lines, with the United States being the enemy lines, uh, hoping that uh, somehow... Uh, Raphael Eaton and his handlers, as promised, would be able to get him out of this jam and get him to simply emigrate to Israel, as had been the case uh, with uh, other uh, incidents of people with official covers being caught. Um, and so Weinberger is basically saying here, hey, you know, you're doing this media campaign in the Washington Post, particularly Wolf Blitzer. Uh, his February 15th, 1987 article, in which you're really calling out to mobilize the Israel lobby to get you off the hook, basically. And this response, this four-page response, is, is basically saying you're still spilling information uh, that can get the government in trouble. Uh, and even more so, you're, you're, you're sort of showing already uh, the abusive nature of this relationship. One of the things that, that's mentioned in the Wolf Blitzer article that uh, Pollard collaborated on was the fact that, once again, by getting classified U.S. information, the Israelis were able to preempt U.S. policy uh, by acting first. So, in this case, the U.S. was sending a delegation to Tunisia to open relationships there. And what do the Israelis do but take the coordinates that Pollard had provided and bomb the heck out of the place, causing the U.S. Uh, tender to Tunisia to be fractured and, and preempted? And so, you know, he mentions that, I think, <clears throat> to kind of harken back to the bigger picture of why Israel wanted all of this intelligence, and it's to be able to sort of channel and guide U.S. policies and preempt any actions by the United States that they consider are not in Israel's interest. And that's kind of been the case throughout history. If you go back to the 67 war, for example, the U.S. was working furiously with the Egyptians to get them to wind down, and the Israelis knew that and, and subsequently launched their preemptive airstrikes. And so you see this sort of pattern throughout history uh, through a combination of inside knowledge about what's going on in the United States, the Israelis are really able to subvert U.S. policies uh, because of the inside track. Yeah. Hey, um, man, I don't know. There's so much to go over there, but I want to go a different direction, which sure. is what's the Levon Affair? The Levon Affair is a reference to the 1954 Israeli agent attacks on installations in Egypt uh, through terrorist bombings in, in a failed attempt to get the United States uh, to think the Egyptians were attacking the U.S. and the West and, and not withdraw and let the canal revert to Egyptian control and sovereignty. And so that was one of the first instances of the Israelis trying to do a false flag operation against the United States to affect a policy outcome. And it's funny you should mention that, because as you know, we've been working
working our way through 67 boxes of classified documents about the first Senate investigation into the Israel lobby. And uh, coincidentally, uh, box one, which was just released a week ago, uh, explains why there was a massive investigation of the Israel lobby. There's a March 17, 1961 secret memo which mentions the Levon affair twice, uh, which uh, mentions that as a reason for launching the investigation. And it has this chilling sentence in the memo, which says, uh, quote, there would undoubtedly, even with care, be instances which would lead to foreign governmental protests, to violent attacks by special groups in the United States, unquote. But wow. the, the Senate classified that as a gray operation and sort of leaves open the question as, w as to whether any of the targets were picked by uh, U.S. operators in conjunction with the Israelis. And so there's always been this, this battle, and we see this battle being replayed in the 2005 APAC espionage indictments, where uh, the lobby and uh, Israel are always trying to get their hands on this sort of information so they can either front-run or preempt or move around U.S. policies that are designed in, in uh, a broader interest than purely their own. So uh, that is, if you know, we talk about the damage assessment. It's not about the intelligence of the United States. It's the, it really, it's about being able to preempt policies, which again, the policies are debatable. Some of them are, are not perfect, but Eisenhower thought it was a good policy to let the Egyptians have their canal back, and the Israelis didn't. And they were willing to attack the United States and try and pin it on the Israel or the Egyptians to get the United States and uh, and uh, you know the the Western powers to stay and control the canal. And that's the kind of stuff they've been doing ever since. So that's what makes it so interesting, as I've said often. Well, and this is what uh, Larry Franklin, who was the top Iran analyst at the Pentagon uh, was taking was, uh, according to his indictment, I believe, or, um, well, you probably got the footnote uh, offhand better than me, uh, what he was getting was the internal debates, Condoleezza Rice and the National Security Council talking about what are we going to do about Iran so that the Israelis would be, I guess, uh, Ariel Sharon's administration would be better able to uh, you know, fix their talking points and their bogus intelligence and whatever they needed to uh, be better able to get America into a war with Iran on their behalf. Well, I, I tend to think it was much bigger than that. I mean, the Israelis don't mess around with just policy. This is the whole point of... Oh, yeah, I guess I, I meant to say this was one part of what he took. <laughs> the fast boats in the Persian Gulf coming up and attacking U.S. ships or tankers. I mean, that's the sort of false flag opportunities, and you've mentioned this before on your show, were what led a senior official to go into the region and say, hey, you know, we don't want another uh, USS Liberty here in the Gulf because, uh, you know, just because you, you don't like U.S. policy toward Iran. Yeah, it was but Admiral Mullen that did that. This is the constant battle because you've got, you know, again, people like John Bolton in this country and others who ideologically at least, uh, would be happy to see some sort of conflagration or, you know, modern Levant affair touch off, you know, U.S. military conf confrontation with Iran. But, you know, the fact that the Israelis have so much invested in this sort of intelligence gathering and that there's almost never any sort of consequence is, is what's, you know, truly disturbing. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, I'm kind of glad that it's 2010 now and we can look back at the last decade basically, of terror war. And we can see how from the very beginning, it started in the London Times, I think. Uh, Rai from Anti-Neocon sent me this footnote. Uh, Israeli agents say that they witnessed Iraqi intelligence hand a flask of anthrax to Mohammed Atta in Prague, in the Czech Republic. <laughs> yeah, and, wow. and this is where that started. And and from the very beginning, Netanyahu, you can go to AmericanRhetoric.org and, and read Netanyahu's first speech to Americans 
uh, after September 11th. And, and the entire Israeli program since then has been to try to conflate all of their enemies with ours to the point where we're not even at war with this amorphous al-Qaeda anymore. We're at war with Islamic extremism, which, of course, includes all of Israel's enemies. And it's the neoconservatives, as you say, their friends, uh, John Bolton, have this ideological commitment to this foreign state, which, as you've outlined over the last half hour, Grant, has very different interests than ours, that actually we're not the same as them. Our policies, what's good for us, is not necessarily what's good for Israel or vice versa. And, right. and, and now we can all see that clearly, can't we? After all this time, after all this mess, a war with Iraq, another that we might have to get into with Iran. Uh, you still have to look pretty hard. <laughs> you still have to look pretty hard. Yeah, well, look at IRMEP. That's I-R-M-E-P <laughs> dot org. Institute for Research Middle East Policy. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, Scott.